Well, as a financial journalist, really what drives me uh, is to educate retail investors. And there's just such a demand out there from ordinary South Africans to take control of their savings and investment journeys. And in the wealth tech space, if you just look at the US platforms, you've got Betterment, Wealthfront, Robinhood, they've really all been hitting their straps, enabling millions of new investors to access investment products. Uh, Robinhood at its IPO. We won't talk about the tech sell-off and what's happened since, but many achieving unicorn status. And I'm really excited to go behind the scenes now with my next guest who took his experience building a digital health plan, Discovery Health Smart Plan. It's kind of like the Oscar insurance uh, package, and that remains the fastest growing medical aid health and uh, his postdoc at Oxford to help more South Africans save and invest. Tom Brennan, CEO and co-founder of Frank. Uh, really good to have you here presenting at this FinTech conference. And you've just recently raised fresh VC funding. So, so things are going quite well for you. Firstly, what is Frank? And why did you start this business? Sure. So Frank is a savings and investment platform. Uh, we allow first-time investors to invest through our mobile application. Uh, and also now we're launching a chat so allowing somebody to invest through their Facebook Messenger chat. Um, in addition, though, we've also exposed our uh, API as a savings as a service for third-party platforms and companies to be able to allow their clients to save and invest. We're a licensed FSP, South Africa's first robo-advisor. And really, our mission is to make investing easy and accessible uh, for all South Africans, which currently means... Uh, that it's a, it's a real greenfield market. Only 5% of mm. South Africa invest. So most of the country are saving, but not investing. And that's the real opportunity that we see. The other SaaS, saving as a service, forget about software as a service. Now, in, in South Africa, one of the big focuses of the financial industry is obviously on providing financial access and inclusion to the whole population. It's often spoken about the base of the pyramid. How do we deepen financial inclusion? Why do you believe that financial access and inclusion are so important to South Africa and South Africa's future? Well, as I'm sure you know, South Africa has one of the largest kind of wealth and income inequality rates in the world. Um, you know, for me, uh, a primary driver of that is actually the, the, the lack of uh, investing. Uh, Thomas Piketty, a French economist, you know, showed very powerfully in, capital, in his book, Capital in the 21st Century, that the rates of return on capital have largely been greater than growth of wages uh, for the last 150 years. And what that means is, you know, people that rely on um, invested capital as a proportion of their income, uh, and at the very wealthy, obviously, you can imagine that's almost all of their income, it will just slowly but surely move away from those who are relying on their wages. So for me, I think it's a, it's a very important question, and it's a fundamental question that South Africa really needs to address. And as I touched on earlier, you know, the savings rates in South Africa are actually pretty good. You know, 65% of the population are putting some money aside on a monthly basis, if we to believe old mutuals savings and investment monitor survey that they do annually. The problem is, is only 5% are investing. So the vast majority of people are actually not deploying their capital. You know, it's either being left as cash under the mattress or in their bank account, uh, or even putting it into a stock fill. Um, so what we want to do, obviously, is trying to help people deploy their money, invest that money um, to really get a return that allows them to you know, beat inflation and grow their wealth over time. So it really is a, a critical issue, I think, for South Africans um, to see how we can remove the barriers of access, which have been in place for, I think, uh, far too long. Yeah, we've had democracy for uh, well over a quarter of a, a century, but we haven't had the dividends and the gains of that because I don't think there's enough focus on this particular issue, on financial literacy and education. Because as, as you say, we're saving, we're just not doing the right things with it. Maybe it's because we watch our president that we, we're sticking money under the mattress. But uh, clearly, uh, South Africans are not financially literate or, or don't know enough to take advantage of these opportunities. So how do you see products like Frank helping South Africans bridge that gap, understand how to invest their money and, and where to invest it effectively? You know, I think the first thing is really to start with the mission. You know, if, um, I'm an engineer. I don't come from a financial family or financial background. And I've always been frustrated by the information asymmetry that really exists in the world of finance. Uh, you know, people have capitalized on that asymmetry, um, you know, to their, typically their own advantage. So our mission really is to make um, money management uh, understandable and to empower our users 
to be able to make an investment decision that they can understand and, and uh, have control over. So, you know, what we do is through our application, we provide really simple tools that allow somebody to understand how much their investment could be worth, uh, were they to invest it, obviously compared to leaving it in cash and, or in, in a bank account, as well as how much they need to put away if they want to have a specific target in mind. So think of, you know, investing uh, for your child's education, for example, in a few years' time. In addition to that, we produce you know, a lot of educational content. We have a weekly blog and podcast that goes out. And you have to do that in multimedia format now. So from YouTube to podcasts, you know, to, to blogs. Um, and we also have an online academy, which is sort of more structured learning. So really allowing somebody to kind of go from the basics, you know, like what is money, money management, budgeting, understanding debt. Uh, to more conflict, to more complex uh, topics like diversification and why that's so important. But I think what we've seen, and as I referenced in my introduction, there is a huge thirst out there among the retail mm. investor. Uh, the men and women on the street want to take greater ownership and control, and I think it's evidence in the rise of of um, these kinds of fintech applications that are looking to to bridge. Uh, but it's also a convergence of factors. I think it's a lot more accessible. Smartphones, almost everyone's got one. The cost of data is coming down, so you can reach that consumer. As the CEO of an innovative financial services company like Frank, I'm, I'm sure you're an expert on APIs. And I was chatting to Investec recently. They're really leading and opening up their banking, which I think for gray issue bankers, I mean, that, that's quite bold. In what ways do you believe APIs are key to shaping a future where financial services are both accessible and inclusive throughout South Africa? So, you know, it's, it's well known that there, is, uh, there are many friction costs in finance. Uh, you know, estimates by the World Bank have as much as 10% of all money flows uh, are borne out in costs of friction uh, in multiple points in time. And that's not only sort of transactional friction, but that's also in kind of onboarding friction, you know, and as a result, many uh, traditional financial services players, um, you know, have very high minimums, right, which a lot of people just cannot afford in order to get started. So APIs can radically transform that space. On, on the one hand, you've got digital KYC uh, processes and platforms that allow you to, whether that's plugging into the home affairs via API or into companies that are dedicated now uh, in kind of conducting all of the know your customer and anti-money laundering um, checks that are necessary for sort of um, financial clients and financial transactions. And then obviously the APIs can allow um, partnership between sort of non-competing entities where maybe they have a license as a credit provider and we have a license as an investment platform. And there can be a natural um, synthesis between the two of us and if you allow for the computers to communicate effectively, automatically, you can just imagine how those friction costs are being reduced. Uh, no longer do you need to hire somebody who's going to be you know, ensuring the transaction or uh, picking up the telephone to make sure that, that uh, whatever that trade or that deal goes through. So I really see APIs as being transformative in just reducing some of those friction costs. And obviously, my hope is that that reduction can be passed on to the consumer by reducing the minimums of kind of access to entry, uh, as well as also obviously the transaction costs, which are currently borne by the consumers. Well, I'm sure it will be passed on to the consumer eventually because, um, you know, as other players see this, if you're not doing it, they'll, they'll come in and they'll, mm -hmm. they'll attack that part of the value chain. And, and so, you know, ultimately, this really is good news for the consumer and will probably enable this buzzword that we always talk about, collaboration, as you say. Uh, Non-competing entities have this ability now to, uh, to enter into a collaborative partnership where both win and the consumer mm -hmm. wins as well. Now, regulation is obviously a big thing in financial services. Services and you know one of the biggest challenges I think is having a back office, having to deal with the reams of, of regulation and regulatory bodies. Are there areas where we're making good progress? Areas where you think we need to improve? Um, so I think good progress at a very high level, you know, was by implementing the Twin Peaks legislation in uh, 2018. You know, it allowed for the Prudential Authority and the Conduct Authority to really focus on the areas of um, you know uh, specialization. Unfortunately, where we stand, you know, as a fintech that's, you know, trying to do exciting and new things, um, we found it frustrating. Uh, the FSCA, uh, the Conduct Authority, did set up a fintech sandbox 
but unfortunately they weren't empowered, I believe, to offer exemptions uh, for license applications. A couple of fintechs that we know actually were um, shut down as a result of them not being able to find a way through the uh, kind of the regulatory uh, mesh uh, that we currently have. But I think, you know, there are dialogues. We are in dialogue with them. And I really hope that it's it'll take time. And by design, you know, regulators are not supposed to be, you know, radically shifting organizations. So it's just going to take time for us to kind of, you know, bring them along, you know, help them understand the technology. As said, you know, we were South Africa's first robo-advisor. Um, uh, but something that I discovered as part of that, actually, they'd never seen an engineering degree um, because they hadn't actually received that as a qualification. So, you know, I'm breaking personally, I'm breaking new <laughs> grounds as a key individual, you know, with the contact authority. So um, that's exciting. Well, uh, engineers, as we know, are naturally problem solvers. So uh, I'm sure you, you're solving for this regulatory mess as you go. But I mean, yeah, I'll, I'll agree with you. Regulators don't have to necessarily uh, wake up and, and find ways to enable business, but they should be waking up and saying, how can we grow the industry and how can we be partners here in a responsible manner? So I, I do hope that that conversation evolves and matures. Now, the, the pandemic has obviously had a major impact on the financial industry, uh, just for banks, for example, lot, lots more people using digital channels. In your experience, what are the main trends that COVID has caused and which of these do you think is going to be sticky into the future? So in one sense, I think it really prompted uh, many people to start having a digital relationship with money, um, whether that's from investing uh, platforms. So we definitely saw an uptick uh, where people needed to get advice, but obviously they couldn't meet with a financial advisor face to face, but also mobile banking and, and retail, you know, e-commerce, people were forced to kind of start using buying food from their supermarket. And obviously mm -hmm. by breaking down some of those barriers of, um, of trust, you know, of being able to make a transaction online digitally, um, I think really helps the ecosystem as a whole. Uh, so we definitely saw a, an uplift in that regard. And specifically when it comes to investing, you know, I think it was a rainy day for many people. A lot of people either lost their jobs or saw like a real reduction in their, their monthly income. And I think, you know, psychologically, we're not very good about planning for the future. Um, but so when you get hit with that, um, that emergency, it really uh, shook a lot of people. Uh, and obviously then, you know, we were able to capitalize on that to many, uh, for many people saying, listen, first thing is set up an emergency fund with Frank. You know, your money is invested in Alan Gray Money Market Fund. It's very safe. It's going to give you investment returns that beat any savings account with a bank. You can get access to the money whenever you need. So it really can and should act as an emergency fund uh, for and does for a lot of our users. So I think that was a real big wake-up call. And then last but not least, just as a startup and as a business, we, we had to change the way in which we worked. You know, no longer could we all get together in the same office and, you know, debate and, and figure out how to solve problems. Um, we had to work remotely. You know, thankfully, in this day and age, it's quite easy. So we actually had remote and collaborative online working environments, you know, Google Workspaces, for example. So it wasn't a radical change in the way in which we did do business. But mm. I think that the way in which people work now has fundamentally changed. You know, why do you need to get on a plane and go have a face-to-face -face meeting when you can easily jump on a, a Zoom call and, and connect with that person face-to-face -face online and be able to have that same discussion? So, um, yeah, I think there are some positives and some negatives, some big learning curves. Uh, but, yeah, I'm obviously hoping the economy will bounce back because I still think a lot of people are still struggling and with the increase in, in fuel prices and the cost of living you know, there's not a lot of surplus to invest on a monthly basis. And that's the story yeah. we hear a lot from our uh, from our users. Yeah, that's a story I get all the time on the show. And I always try and say, well, try and pay yourself first. But that, mm. that little bit that you can is being whittled away through all of these increases. Uh, but it's very interesting to hear you say that the pandemic potentially was the gateway to opening uh, people's uh, eyes to saving and investing in particular, because uh, as you said, you know, that emergency fund, I think many people were found short. So it's a great way to frame the opportunity in what was a very difficult period. And obviously, you know, we're having conferences like this and we can do it online. So, you know, all of these things are, are, are really positive. If uh, any of our attendees uh, are wanting to get hold of you, want to sign up for Frank, how do they do this? Sure. 
Um, so you can just email uh, hello at frank.app. That's F-R-A-N-C dot A-P-P. Um, and if they want to get started, the easiest way is just uh, going to frank.app forward slash start uh, on their mobile phone, and they'll be redirected to the app stores, um, you know, whichever app store they, they have, and they can download. It literally takes less than two minutes to sign up and create an investment goal. Uh, and even through the app, you can um, deposit your first sort of investment contribution, which will reflect immediately. So you really can become an investor in, in two minutes. And for all of those people that have always put off the decision of investing, I'm sure you've heard that saying, you know, everyone says the best time to start investing was 20 years ago. Uh, <laughs> the second best time is today. So uh, I really do encourage people to, you know, to make that leap and just get started. And once you get started, you'll see the ball rolling. Uh, yeah. And it's surprising how addictive that is. Yeah. And I've been on the Frank website. There's another saying, I think Warren Buffett said, an investment in knowledge pays the best interest. And there's so much knowledge on the blog. It really is a, a, a trove of uh, useful information. Tom Brennan, CEO and co-founder of Frank, thank you so much for talking frankly about uh, how you plan to get more South Africans investing through tech here at the Business Tech FinTech Conference 2022. Don't go anywhere, folks. Uh, we got some great speakers lined up just after this. 